everybody. If you haven't got a, got a drink in hand, please feel free to, to go and grab a, a drink and take it back to your table or your, your windowsill, wherever you're perching uh, for the evening. A very, very warm welcome to you all to the launch event this evening for the Hidden Fires. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. To kick off our evening tonight, we're going to have some live original music uh, from Hamish Napier. Hamish is one of the most accomplished folk musicians in Scotland, um, who plays with a number of other um, really, really celebrated musicians like him, uh, including Ross Ainsley, Duncan Chisholm, um, Patsy Reed, Innes Watson, Sue Ali, <coughs> and in various ensembles. He's produced three uh, fabulous albums <coughs> all about this area, the railway, um, the woods, and the river, and the woods won album of the year at the Scots Trad Music Awards in 2020. Um, yay! <laughs> he, is, um, he is my co-host for the Storyland Sessions, series of story and music events uh, held here in Badenoch that we run together. Um, and He's also an incredibly kind and generous friend who's doing all of this microphone wrangling and playing music for me tonight for this launch, which she insisted on doing as a gift. So please welcome Hamish Nathan. Hey. Thank you very much, Meryn. And I'm very excited. I got my copy of the book today and I'm very excited to read it. <laughs> Um, okay, so I wanted to do uh, some music that ties in with um, Nan Shepherd's adventures through the, the Grampians and the Cairngorms, and so I looked through some really old collections, and here's a tune by Captain Simon Fraser uh, from 1780. <laughs> I'm gonna, well, that's called the North Side of the Grampians, and I follow that with a tune called the South Side of the Grampians by James Porteous, and that's uh, written in 1800. And then on to, and I'm going to play that as a reel, so it kind of picks up tempo. And then we end up uh, at, uh, with a tune on the top of the Grampians, it's called. And that's by Colin McPherson, good local name. Uh, I'm not sure who he was, um, but it, it was published in a, in a collection in 1904. These tunes would all have been played by fiddle players in Badenoch and Strathspey 100 years ago. Loads of people would have played these tunes, so I dug them out of these old collections, and I don't know if any of them have been played for, for years, and probably never on a flute, so here we go. <laughs> the Grampian Suite.
introduce to you our chair for this evening, Neil Reed. Um, Neil Reed's Twitter handle and true identity is Cairngorm Wanderer. Uh, he has a blog of the same name on which you will find the consummate Cairngorm reading list. Um, and it's been Neil's reading list that has been uh, my other kind of guide through the mountains, as well as Nairn Shepherd. Uh, he spent 15 years as a uh, sort of main kind of communications head for Mountaineer in Scotland, and in that role was editor of Scottish Mountaineer magazine. And he actually um, picked up on the residency that I was involved with for the National Park in 2019 um, with a great deal of enthusiasm. He got the bug for writing Kengorn's lyrics um, and actually had some lyrics and uh, another piece of prose in the anthology that we published at the end of that year and uh, came all the way up to join us in the launch and to celebrate at the end of that year. And he was very enthusiastic when I shared that I was going to be writing this book and asked for some sage advice uh, and then he went on to valiantly read through a, an early rough draft uh, and offer some incredibly extensive and helpful feedback. So I just knew um, that Neil was absolutely the right person to, to be the chair for this event tonight. He was really um, excited to accept, but I think he's been regretting it ever since. <laughs> so please, a very warm welcome to Neil Reed. Right, well, you're, you're pardon the crib sheet. Um, I wrote all this well in advance and had the option of either memorising it this week or going up the hills for three days. <laughs> <laughs> and I've said it. <laughs> Uh, most of you uh, probably already know Merrin, uh, but for those who don't, the quick version um, goes, um, she was born to Australian parents in a former palace in Kathmandu, very ordinary, um, <laughs> grew up in Nepal, India and Pakistan. As a writer, uh, her first major work was a stage play, uh, The Long Way Home. And it and three other radio plays have been broadcast by the BBC. And her short stories have been widely anthologised and broadcast on uh, BBC Radio 4. Her first novel, A uh, House Called Astrobal, was unsurprisingly set in India. And it was published in 2014. Uh, her second novel, though, Of Stone and Sky, was set in Badenoch, where she now lives, um, and was long listed for the 2021 Highland Book Prize, and also won the Book of the Year at the Bookmark Festival. Um, as she said, in 2019, she became the first writer in residence for the Cairngorms National Park, and with no template to follow, I think she made a, a huge impact uh, in that role, which is, probably still continuing through the, the Storyland sessions here. Um, most recently, of course, uh, comes the book launch today, The Hidden Fires. Now, for a lot of us here, the Cairngorms are home, and others of us have been regular visitors so long that these hills seem like home. So, as we come here to launch a new book about the Cairngorms, the obvious question is, what business does an Australian have coming over here and telling us We can ask that and, uh, how she got the courage up. But really, this book that's being launched today is its own justification. Um, the Hidden Fires is a very special book which really deserves to be read and is much to reward the reader. It deserves to be read because it's about Karen Gorms, obviously, um, because it's about Nan Shepherd and her writing and her philosophy, and it's about Mary Glover herself. And at all counts, it entertains, educates, and fascinates. As you read, you'll come across things that make you smile and recognition from your own experiences, or will stop you in surprise at a new way of opening something you thought you knew. You might also disagree sometimes. You might say, no, it's, it's not like that. But even in disagreement, you find that you've paused and re-examined what you thought you knew already and what you thought was settled. Always a good thing. So it manages 
to be both comforting and challenging in its different levels and satisfying in its depth because it's not just a superficial run through days out what I've had in the Cairn Gorms. It's, it's really quite a deeply felt and consummately expressed response to the Cairn Gorms. Miss Merrin discovers them for herself and comes to know and love them. And it's a response to the same journey made and described by Nan Shepherd, almost a conversation between the two, uh, divided by years, but united in their goal to share a love with any reader willing to open themselves to that sharing. Now I've read this book both in an early draft and in the finished form, which we have before us now, both times with approached it with an element of excitement and impatience, really. <laughs> um, but it's not a book that allows itself to be rushed. The recognition of pace, of place, of emotion, and the intellectual charge all conspire to, to slow down that headlong rush with a, a wee tug at the sleeve and an invitation to just tarry and so consider more of what you've just read. And if I ever started in a rush, what I found in the Hidden Fires is a place of great calm, and hopefully you'll find that too as you read it. But uh, to ease you into the mood for it, uh, we'll welcome Merrin here to give the first of, uh, brief reading uh, from the book, and then I'll start interrogating. Looking forward to that. So I followed Nan Shepherd's the title, the chapter titles from The Living Mountain, um, but they're all in a different order, apart from the last one uh, in both The Living Mountain and in The Living Fires is the chapter being. And she had a foreword at the start of The Living Mountain. I have something that's called The Beginning. At the beginning of every one of my chapters, there is a quote, this one is, I set out on my journey in pure love. She is old now. At 84, she begins to feel something in her bones, to clear and tidy her things, to see a long way. Her thick hair is caught back in the familiar bun, iron gray and wavy, except where it turns to a pure white around her face, ruddy with life lined and loose as a beloved map. Strong knotted hands open a forgotten drawer. Fingers move papers, fall on a typed manuscript. She takes it to a garden chair above the river and reads. By the end, the light has changed and all color gathered to the western hills. Beyond lies the mountain. It was 1977, and Nan Shepherd was not finished. For the first time in years, she took out a fresh sheet of paper. Thirty years in the life of a mountain is nothing, the flicker of an eyelid. So began her foreword to the living mountain, her slim but boundless book about the Cairngorms range of Scotland. That was the length of time between her first writing the text and publishing it. And along with recording the changes in that period, she affirmed the enduring validity of her original account. Another 45 years have passed since then, another mere blink for the massive, another cycle of change, and now another woman charting its story. The Hidden Fires is an account of my pilgrimage deeper into the Cairngorms and my own sense of being, with Nan Shepherd as invisible friend, walking guide, writing tutor, and fellow wanderer. I have followed in her footsteps and, like her, have not confined specific locations to specific chapters, but allowed the narrative to wander across the range and the ideas in the same all-embracing spirit. After this opening, the 12 chapter titles are hers, but in a different order as befits my different journey, though we converge on the last one. Throughout, I have sought to inhabit her experience, as her text invites us to do. But rather than as an actor playing out a script, I have drawn from her words to animate my own story on the great stage of the Cairngorms, discovering our intersections and divergences, 
our places of one mind and our points of departure. I think it would have pleased her to know that she became for me the perfect hill companion. Such a person, she wrote, is the one whose identity is for the time being merged in that of the mountains as you feel your own to be. Writing this book felt like a quiet, expansive conversation across time with her, a very different woman about a place that has shaped us both. <coughs> now, after the start of this, I mentioned the audacity of coming here and telling us about our own hills. <coughs> but I mean, obviously, you know, here and throughout Scotland and wherever else people uh, read this, there'll be a lot who, are, like I say, have lived here all their lives, they know the hills deeply. Did you feel it was audacious to come here and range on and write your own book? <laughs> um, well, well, kind of yes and no. I mean, I, I wrote the book in response to an invitation from the publisher. So I think in, in one sense, without that, um, I might have felt I didn't have the, the audacity to do that, to respond to such a, a legendary book and such a celebrated writer um, would have seemed, you know, um, presumptuous. Um, but on the other hand, I, I guess I also believe that anyone should be allowed to write about anything, um, and that I don't ever write out of a sense of entitlement. Um, I write out of a sense of curiosity, uh, out of a uh, out of a passion for something, a desire to learn, um, and. What matters is how well you do it. Mm -hmm. And you've sort of answered the next question is why did you feel compelled to write the book? Um, because I was told two doesn't count. Well, I guess I could have said no. Um, <laughs> it was an invitation, um, but I, I did also then need to, to, to do some sample writing and, and offer an outline and a plan mm -hmm. for that um, and for them to then decide that that was worth taking on. So I did really need to decide for myself was it a project that I that I could love, that I could have the, the passion mm -hmm. for, otherwise it would be a chore yeah. um, and, and it would be too frightening. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in, the, in that process of pondering it, uh, of rereading her book, which obviously I, I had read before, but rereading it again and, and kind of looking up at those hills and thinking, yes, could I, could I undertake this journey and would that be, be a, a, more of a joy than a challenge? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that was one. And do you think... The fact that you were um, not rewriting but responding to an existing work um, made it easier or did that raise its own complications? Yeah, I think it's harder actually, mm. <clears throat> particularly because it is such a celebrated work. And it was very clear to me from the beginning that there's no point trying to write another The Living Mountain. You know, it exists and you're never going to write anything better than, than she has in that, in that sense. So it had very much had to be a different story and coming at it from a different angle. So I guess that was the sense where actually all those things that you said that, that I am an Australian and I grew up in the Himals and, you know, in a sense that gives it a very different angle to the mm -hmm. one that she's come from. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was interesting for me to explore and it's just always been interesting for me in a life that has moved through different places and dwelt differently, deeply but in different places, how that contrasts with people who are very, very rooted in one place, which she was, you know, she mm -hmm. spent her yeah. entire life in one bedroom, apart from the first few months and the last few months, whereas by the time I was 19, I had moved 60 times. <laughs> so I felt that that in itself was a very interesting starting point really that we had such different starting points coming to the mm -hmm. same hills we were both in our early 20s when we first walked up on the, onto the Cairngorms um, and we were both in our early 50s when we were writing our book about them so mm -hmm. there were some things like that that were similar but so many other things that were different in terms of yeah. the way we came to the mountains mm -hmm. so it's, it's an interesting thought that, that she was in her early 20s when she was wandering the hills there it's maybe just me. I, I always pictured her as being quite mature as she wandered the hills, but really she wasn't. <laughs> well, the first walk, which was actually up Craig Do above Loch mm -hmm. um, was in her early 20s, and she went alone, um, yeah. which was really courageous. Um, mm -hmm. And then she just went as far as the ridge that looks across 
Glen Eina to Bray Rick. And that was this sort of extraordinary moment for her, this vision of the plateau in, in, in winter whites. It was like October mm -hmm. and it had snowed. Um, and, you know, that's what she said from that moment, you know, I was enthralled to the Kingles. Um, but then she said it was a number of years before she then went further up, right up to Ben McDooley. So I think she was in her 30s by that yeah. time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because she was writing The Living Mountain in her early 50s, um, we often just picture her at that age. Yes, it had that's been, right. It had started. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and, and went on till she was no longer physically able to get right up there. But she was definitely still, she was still visiting in this area. In fact, uh, John Lyle who's here tonight. His neighbor used to chauffeur her around here in the late 70s um, right. when she was still visiting in the area. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. right. And you mentioned um, you, you stole my book list <laughs> uh, when you were doing the research for this. And I mean, it, it's plain you have read uh, an awful lot about the Cairngorms you know, from this book. But what, uh, what about the walking the ground? I mean, did you find you had to go places anew uh, for the book or did you rely on walking that you'd already done in the area? No, I definitely needed to do a lot more. Um, mm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm absolutely not a Ken Gorms expert, <laughs> um, and certainly wasn't at the, at the outset. Um, and you know, so there'd been a few favourite walks that I'd enjoyed, but um, it was that was one of the great things about about the taking up that challenge was um, to actually then have to go and find a, a lot of places and go to a lot of places I hadn't before. Um, and particularly coming in from D side, because I guess being a bit lazy, you just tend to go in from this side because we live here. Yeah. <laughs> so to go around the other side of the mountain and, and, and come in from that side, those were some of the new, the new experiences for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And what, uh, what in the book or in preparing for the book do you think was the most challenging? You know, you, you've got the the sitting down, reading everything bit, you've got the, the going out and exploring bit. Out of it all, what do you think was the, the biggest challenge you faced? Um, I think one of them certainly was actually um, coming to terms with um, ice axes and crab horns. <laughs> so I thought I would read um, at this moment, particularly because we have got John Lyle here tonight. Where are you, John? Ah, there he is. Because um, John very kindly took me out on a day of winter skills training and in my chapter Frost and Snow I, I talk about that and that was um, early 2020 actually um, so it was just before we were all going into lockdown um, there was lots of blizzards and storms I don't know if people remember um, so we'd had to delay it a couple of times because of blizzards and storms and things um, and eventually we did actually manage to get a day up on the hill just shortly before lockdown <coughs> so that was in March of 2020 and uh, you know, prior to that, I hadn't, I hadn't used crampons and ice axes and things like that. So I really, really had to kind of get a grip of, of all of those things. So this is part of that experience. And we're in uh, Korean Trekki. I look out across the undulating expanse of snow around me at the singing sky. It is what locals call a bluebird day. John and I walked here without jackets and are sitting in the sunshine, eating sandwiches. Everything appears serene and safe. It looks like the time when Shepard walked all day through millions of sparkling sun spangles on the frosty snow. I am learning, as she so often points out, how deceptive appearances can be. It is why I am here to gain winter skills that I may walk safely into the serenity. And now the easy bit is over, the path, the looking and talking, the packed lunch. Now I must throw myself down the mountain. The prospect of this has twisted inside me like a dark snake from the moment I bought my first ice axe two months ago. I had no intention of taking up climbing, certainly not in winter, so I hadn't thought I would need one. In all my snowy walking of the past, I'd never had an axe or even crampons. Looking back, much of that walking had been on clear paths or in mild conditions, and in truth, I should have been better equipped. I don't know what I imagined I would do if I fell down a slope, but I certainly hadn't conjured stunts with a metal pick. Now Shepard hadn't warned me either, but John is clear. I will teach you how to do this, but I hope you never have to use it. 
If you learn to walk properly, you never will. Part of that walking in winter involves awareness of every step, the senses keyed, as Shepherd describes it. We make our way up the slope, kicking a level ledge for each bootfall. For experienced mountaineers, it becomes instinctive, but for beginners, it means consciously noting where and how you put your feet and your weight, depending on the conditions of the snow, the gradient, the fall line, and the landscape around. We reach a spot where John hollows out a seat in the slope. Poached in it, he explains the technique of an ice axe arrest, pushes off cheerfully, and performs the maneuver with a dancer's grace. My stomach churns. The worst moment for me is wriggling into position in the hollow, looking down the sheer snow and thinking about it. I say aloud each thing I have to remember in more or less the right order, though several things are supposed to happen at the same time. Grab, spike, roll, feet up, face away, arch body, dig axe in under shoulder, come to elegant stop. <laughs> Deep breath and I push off. Cue, frantic fumbling, face turned the wrong way, feet ploughing into the snow, and me skeetering down with the axe dragging well above me. I do stop, mercifully, though mainly because of the natural friction of my jacket. <laughs> I am never parted with this jacket. I am alive. John is smiling. <laughs> yeah, that that uh, is one of the things I loved about the book. It's, it can be very, very thoughtful and quite deep, um, but at the same time, you know, there's laugh out loud moments in it. <laughs> um, you talked about, um, you know, the mental processes you went through in coming up with the book and getting to grips with it. What do you hope the reader comes away with from this? big question. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting though because it's a question that in a sense was answered for me um, by somebody who read it in, in draft form because I'd kind of reached out on Facebook to say are there folks out there that might like to read a draft? I'm looking for people that don't know Scotland or the Cairngorms or Nan Shepherd, you know, um, so coming at it completely cold to see how it lands. <clears throat> and um, somebody that I went to school with who's Indian but now living in France said, yeah, I'll read it. Um, so she's not particularly into mountains either. Um, so she read it, and one of the things that she said, which I think answers your question is, she said, it makes me want to go out into my own landscape and, and explore it. So I think that's the thing, whether it's the Kengons or it's, you know, the creek near where you live, um, that invitation to go and be in the beauty of the natural world, to, to observe it closely, to find yourself a part of it rather than just looking at it. Um, mm. That would be um, a joy for yeah. <coughs> Quite worth it too. <laughs> right. And from your point of view, uh, I mean, there's the obvious satisfaction of, you know, the creation and of, of getting the damn thing over with. <laughs> but uh, do you think you've gained anything in particular from Having written the book, uh, has it changed the way you've thought about the Cairngorms, yourself, anything? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think for me, you know, that the thing that I'm hoping that readers discover is what I discovered was that mm -hmm. that you know there is the challenge, you know, like that winter skills experience of actually having to, to come to terms with with risk and that it's a quite a harsh terrain uh, and it can be really, really difficult conditions. So there is all of that challenge to come to terms with, but there's also the kind of deeper challenge of actually being fully present to the world around mm. us. And, um, and that's the thing that I think I've learned and still need to stop myself, you know, when I'm out on a, on a walk and you're just kind of stomping along and you're in your head and you're not actually yeah. in the space. Um, so that reminder to be more fully present to the world mm -hmm. around and to take to take long longer, you know, slower walks because actually if you stop to look and really see a dog violet for the first time up close or, you know, get right down to see some of those tiny, tiny plants that grow up on the on the plateau or realise if you sit still for long enough that there's a dot yeah. you know, and things like yeah. that. But actually um, that's probably been some of the biggest mm -hmm. change in me is is that and it's something that you have to keep returning to, but 
it's not a switch that you turn on and it's always on. You have to keep keep coming back to on centre to really to really be and observe in a place. I think quite a, a valuable thing you, you said in the book was when you talk about walking through the woods and hearing the birds and starting the process of identifying mm, them. Yes. It, it's very easy to read, you know, books like this and talk about, you know, seeing a dotterel or hearing a blackbird or getting a glimpse of some exotic finch or other. But you were <coughs> quite honest about the fact you hadn't a scooby which you were listening to. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and there, there's folks here tonight, like, like Duncan, will often get a message from me. I heard this thing in the woods. I mean, it was kind of tweeting. Any idea what that might be? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it, it has definitely been, for me, a, a journey of, from uh, ignorance, you know, from not knowing much about anything mm. to do with, with this environment and, and gradually learning a lot along the way. And um, you learn a lot more if you don't, don't pretend you know stuff. <laughs> And on, on the, the mountain routes that you, you've done, uh, either before or for this, in the Living Mountain, Nan Shepherd is famously or notoriously uh, reticent about where she actually went. Um, most of her description um, is very vague on actual location. Um, strong on experience, but uh, you know, you'd be struggling to recreate our steps all of the time. You've been the opposite, you've been very specific about your journeys. Um, was, a re was there a reason or is that just the way your mind works? <laughs> yeah, um, part of the reason was that was one of the, the initial invitations from the publisher. Uh, mm. From my publisher was that because the Living Mountain is, you know, is so unclear about where she is a lot of the time mm -hmm. because it wasn't really her interest. She wasn't trying to write a guidebook with with route descriptions. Um, so, but what my publisher recognises a lot of people reading the Living Mountain do wonder where she is or what she's talking about, mm -hmm. um, and so they said, if you can write something that as much as possible kind of anchors it in location, so that we get a sense of where she is if you, if you know where she is or where she might be. Um, so I, I describe a walk up Cory Garvlach and she doesn't mention Cory Garvlach. I mean, I wrote a list of every location she does mention mm -hmm. to, to try and get to those. But there's a number of things that she says, I, I think she was in Cory Garvlach here. I think that's what she's yeah. talking about. But so, so sometimes um, I make that kind of imaginative leap. But a lot mm -hmm. of the intention of it was to actually ground her account a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your last book of Stone and Sky, is that right? Mm -hmm. Always mix it up. <laughs> uh, the landscape was very much almost a character in the book. Uh, you know, it was so exactly drawn. I, I was reading it and I knew where you were talking about, even though it was fictional. Um, and this one is very explicitly about the Cairngorms. Do you think we can expect more about the Cairngorms or are you going somewhere else for your next book? Yeah, good question. Um, lots of ideas, lots of irons in the fire. Um, I have a kind of hankering to write something set in Australia now. I've written some short yeah. stories set in Australia but I, I feel like maybe the next novel <coughs> will be there and I'm going mm -hmm. there at the end of the year for a few months and I'm kind of hoping that will be the, um, the crucible for whatever that I have the, I have a sense of the story that's emerging there mm -hmm. but I feel I need to be there for a while to in a sense to be very pre present to what that environment is like mm -hmm. um, to bring that alive so that, yeah. that's that's a possibility so, so the sense of place is quite important to you, rather than just a character-driven thing. Yes, I think so. I, th I think perhaps because of the number of times I've moved, there is something about a sense of place <coughs> and the distinctiveness of these different places and the different cultures and peoples that I've moved through that is really important to me in, in, in mm -hmm. the writing. 
Um, and I sometimes write to return to a place because Ascaval was set in India, but I had left India when I was writing. Yeah. Um, and similarly, I, I wrote a set of short stories set in Nepal, but they were written after I left Nepal, written just drawing from a whole lot of notes and memories. So sometimes the right, like in most of the Australia book, if I do go ahead and write the Australia book, will be written outside of Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll just be that short visit to kind of reignite a few things. So sometimes it is a way of digging into memory as well as growing into imagination about place. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you find you pay more attention to where you are? Because, um, you know, you've lived in so many places. I get the feeling you could write about any of them, but with somebody else it might just be a blur. You know, oh, I was, I can't remember where I was when I did that. Do you, do you find you have a sort of very sort of conscious awareness of places rather than just this is where I am this week? Maybe. I, th I, think, I think when you're a writer, you're just always a watcher. Mm -hmm. You're just always, you're always looking and listening and... Yeah, just always taking note, even if just in, in mind. Uh, um, yeah, someone gave me a notebook that had written on the front, be careful or you'll end up in my novel. <laughs> 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 but it's one of the things I loved about growing up in Asia, staring is not rude, you know? Because so, <laughs> so, people watching is the best thing, isn't it? Yeah. Even, more than, even yeah. more than place. But. So anyway, getting close to winding up time. You've been a lot of walks for this book and been quite a few walks for of, uh, Stone and Sky as well. Is, is there a, a dream walk that you've still to do in the Cairngorms? Well, I think lots of it that I still need to and want to explore, but um, Ben Arn is one I haven't got to yet and it's mm. partly because it is it takes quite a long time a long to get time up there, doesn't it? It's in the middle of nowhere hill, but um, I do remember somebody's talking to me about it saying, ah, oh, it's just really special. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to explore that. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay, well, if you want to. So a final reading here. Um, so this is at the end of my chapter called um, The Plateau, which originally The Plateau had been Nan Shepherd's title for her whole book. Um, and it was Neil Gunn, the, the novelist that she corresponded with quite a lot. And he was the only person who'd read the whole manuscript at the beginning. And he'd suggested that she come up with a better title, which I think she did. But it's still her first chapter, um, but it uh, comes a little bit later in the book from me. <clears throat> so this is having arrived at the top of Ben Macdui and meeting various people up there. We had a brew of coffee and a chat with the Porridge family, then set off south across the rock-tumbled terrain. Its lip yielded startling views down into Loch Nguanya, one of the four green lochs of the Cairngorms. Not green that day, it was a deep ringing indigo blue that softened to turquoise at the edges where the water was so clear we could see the steep sides sloping down into unfathomable depths. Above us, the sky vaulted in echoing blue holding together the sharp ridge lines, the glowing hills, the distant horizon. The ocean of cloud had slipped away from the nearby chasms and its retreating tide eddied like surf in the valleys. At my feet, grasses like threads of gold were tousled in the breeze and there was no sound but fleeting bird whistles and the rush of a burn. Perched on a rock high above the loch, I watched the sunlight spangling its surface and drew the world into me like breath. Writing of the mountain, Shepherd says, the mind cannot carry away all that it has to give, nor does it always believe possible but it is carried away. No, indeed. The mind cannot even begin to receive it all, let alone retain or understand it. But in the act of trying, the self is enlarged. Beauty opens me. High mountain air stretches my lungs, far views flood my head, the whole wild presence of it expanding the whole of me till I become porous. 
It is not just the sacred space that is thin, but the person who sees it. Wonder pours into me and lifts me up like a lantern floating and filled with light. Perhaps it is what Shepherd meant when she said, one walks the flesh transparent. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think we'll have a few minutes if anybody from the audience would like to ask any intelligent questions for a change. <laughs> I think it's just those times when you're just being soaked to the skin and it's just rain, rain, trudge, trudge and the waterproofs are not that waterproof after all and there's nothing to see and it just seems to go on forever and you know, turn cold and I think that those are some of the worst experiences. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm not, I have not been up there in you know horrible blizzards and all those kinds of things that people have. You know, so that that would undoubtedly be worse because of because of the dangers of it. And I've not, I've not had that experience. Uh, to be honest, I think the rain is worse than the blizzards. <laughs> <laughs> What possesses you to swim in a mountain car in the winter, which you did once, or maybe more than once? Um, yeah, I mean, I talk about that. There's a, there's a whole section in the book about, about the sort of swimming, because um, when I first, you know, again, growing up in South Asia and Australia, swimming outdoors was no great thing, you know, it was just fun. Um, but come moving to Scotland, you know, just kind of rapidly thought, this is, this is just a nightmare. <laughs> this water is utterly boring. So, you know, my swimsuit was kept in the swimming pool and I was cold enough on terra firma, let alone, you know, getting into the, the water. But, so it was partly moving to the area here on the hottest day of the year in 2006 and just actually paddling in Loch Inch here, you know, just with the socks off. That was the kind of beginning of the thawing out. And then just kind of gradually over the years, being able to relinquish a wetsuit, getting a bit more used to swimming in the waters in the summer. Um, and then this, this last winter is the first winter where I've actually uh, kind of kept swimming or dipping momentarily right through till <laughs> December. Um, and I, in terms of what possesses one, I guess it's, it is part of that really elemental experience, you know, it is the, it is the, it does make you feel incredibly alive. Um, in ways that other things don't necessarily, and also b because, particularly up in up in the mountains, you know, in some of those locks up there, it's just such an extraordinary place to be, and to be looking around at these crags and perhaps a bank of snow at the back of the lock and the colours of the rocks under the water, it's such an extraordinary place that to enter it, you know, and I talk about that in swimming up um, at lock in the Loch, Loch Corian Loch, um, which is the highest named loch in the UK, um, there's almost a sense of the sacred because it's something so pure and so elemental about that experience that it is almost otherworldly to enter that, that space and survive. <laughs> hey, Mish. You, you've, uh, you've been exploring in all these amazing nooks and crannies of the Cairngorms, but which place were you in where it felt like you're like there must only be people here like two or three times a year, if that? Where was the most lonely place, like the most kind of, uh, yeah, kind of unvisited place, do you think? Um, I think Loch Corrie and Lochin is probably one that not many people go to, but then you're often surprised by the people that come trooping in, because there isn't really a path to get to it. Um, Cory Gardlach as well, I think, is, it's kind of hard to get all the way up the top of that. Um, yeah. 
I don't know. There's, I mean, that's the interesting thing about the Kengo. There's lots of places you can go to and it feels like nobody would ever come here. Nobody would be here for ages. And then there's sort of party of 60 school children tromping <laughs> 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 by. So, yeah, but I think so the um, Corrie Garb like, had that sort of special sense of inaccessibility about it in some ways. And then Loch Corrie and Loch as well. Um, but yeah, I'll probably think of more as soon as we're finished, yeah. <laughs> I think we'll all have a million questions for you as soon as we've read it all, I've read the book, we'll oh, be wanting to ask you a million questions. I just want to ask, I, I don't know how to articulate this question, but uh, should we be reading less? Because what your book um, communicates to me very powerfully and what um, Nan Shepard's book does likewise is that to read more slowly is more pleasurable. To visit a place and notice the dog wars and the dog roller, you know, is more pleasurable to pay attention to detail. So, would you have any advice on, I suppose is my question, on reading? Should we be forsaking everything else in order to read one book? Um, you know, uh, obviously that applies multiple times in a lifetime, but should we be reading less? Yeah, interesting question. I, I in, in some ways, I'm sort of forced to because I'm not a very fast reader. So I'm often frustrated by the piles and piles of books around and wanting to get through. But I've also recognized that um, when I've tried to read faster, I just don't enjoy it as much. Um, so yeah, perhaps that's, that's a healthy approach to just accept. Because there's millions and millions of books out there. We're never going to read them all. So maybe we just need to be a bit more selective about what we read. And, and read it slowly and with depth, a bit like what we eat <laughs> and where we go, that, that yeah, life is quite short and precious and maybe instead of thinking therefore we have to cram a lot into it, perhaps we should decide that less is more and just take more time with what is more important. Yeah. I, think, I think if I could jump in here and encourage folk not to not read Merlin's book. <laughs> 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 I, th I think uh, not so much reading less, but reading wisely, um, because whether it's this book or Nan Shepherd's or, you know, I've read far too many books with Karen Gorms, for example, but a book can open your eyes when you go there yourself. You know, if you want to walk into Karen Gorms, you could. You could walk right through them several times and miss so much. Mm -hmm. But if you're primed by having read a book, it's possible it, re it directs your thoughts in a particular way, but it also opens your mind to what, what is there, you know, so that you're seeing with a more educated eye. So I would say do read, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll take no, no, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Just linking in the kind of two questions there. Like I'm not a great reader. I'm like you, mate. I'm an extremely slow, more slow, slow than most. I've got this lovely book in front of me, which I will read. But I've not read Nan Shepherd's book. Which should I read first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, interesting. I don't think it matters. Yeah, I don't think it matters. I think um, I think probably reading mine hopefully will make you want to read hers. Um, but yeah, I don't think it would matter actually which way around you, you go. And you know, I love the Living Mountain and, and lots and lots of people do. But I know people that don't. There are people who love mountains but just didn't really love her book for lots of different reasons. So, you know, and that's true of every book. So nobody should feel that they're somehow dumb or they didn't get it or whatever if they didn't enjoy a book that so many people love. <coughs> that's allowed. You know. <laughs> I read yours first. Yeah, it's okay. No, I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> One of the things I enjoyed about Nan Shepherd's book was the reading about the way the mountain influenced the people who lived on the mountain. Of course, people live probably higher up then than they do now, I don't know. But you, although you said the, the time between her book and yours is a blink of an eye, it, it isn't in terms of the way people have lived. And I'm wondering if you reflected on the difference or if you still think it, it still affects, they still affect people the same way in terms of values. 
Yeah, no, I just do talk about that um, and, and those kind of changes, because she reflects on that in her foreword, the changes in the, in the 30 years, um, and obviously significant changes since then, too, in terms of the way, way in which people live <coughs> and relationships with the landscape. Um, but it, it, it's an ongoing challenge in this area, um, because obviously when she was writing, it wasn't a national park. And so I would talk about the implications of that and what that means for the people that live here, that work here, and what that means for the natural landscape and the wildlife. And those, those are ongoing tensions uh, around priorities in terms of this landscape, uh, who it belongs to, who gets to decide, and the question of what is it ultimately for. Um, and uh, so, yeah, those, those are very, very topical questions. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting what you said that your friend said when she read the book and sort of reviewed it for you that she felt like she wanted to go out and find her own landscape. And uh, I guess the similarity between yourself and Nan Shepherd is that you both grew up in the mountains and I myself grew up on the walls in Lancashire, which is not too dissimilar to mountains. And you, you say you find um, that actually the, the it's not necessarily the Cairngorm mountains, you know, the, the, that's the one thing that everyone is revolving around in, in these books, but is it actually to some extent that you're looking for the landscape of your childhood within the Cairngorm, that you're finding within the Cairngorm because you have this sort of affinity to the mountains? Or you know, what extent do you think that uh, halcyon experiences of, of childhood plays in finding you want an landscape? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because there are some people who are very strongly tied to the sea. Um, and so, yeah, mountains are, <clears throat> are really important to me. Um, and I think you're right, partly because of that childhood, um, because um, I, I love being up in mountains. But part of what the book explores was how it, you know, after growing up in the Himalayas, the, you know, initially coming to the Scottish hills, it, it didn't really impress, you know, partly because of all that trudging through rain and cloud and midges and, and the rest of it. Um, and so for me, it was, it was a journey to, to learn to, to really grow to know and to understand and to appreciate the mountains of Scotland, uh, and particularly the Cairngorms, which are in some ways the least dramatic looking of all of Scotland's mountains from the outside. And then but coming to, to go into them, to learn more of their character, to learn their story, uh, and, and therefore what a fascinating range of mountains they are. Um, but yeah, I think you're right, it's probably still partly to do with a, with a sense of affinity for a mountain landscape. Um, but that said, I, I, love this, I love being by the sea too, but yeah, I think there is always something for me very strong about mountains. <coughs> yeah. You speak a lot in the books about sacred and spiritual, especially this one, I think. And I wondered, um, as you started it, what your expectations were in journeying with Nan Shepherd, and how that might have changed you and your faith um, through getting to know and share with her. Yeah, well, that's something that I explore a bit through it, but then particularly in the last chapter, um, because that's, the, that's what comes out a lot in her own last chapter, and particularly in her last paragraph, and where she says, I, um, I think I now understand in some small way why the Buddhist goes on pilgrimage to the mountain. And so I really wanted to unpack why she referenced the Buddhist in particular there, because mountain pilgrimage is true of probably all the you know, great world religions. Um, and for me, having been brought up in the birthplace of Buddhism and grown up around major world religions, I just found it really interesting to reflect upon her own kind of spiritual philosophical journey away from more institutionalized Christianity to what? We don't really know in that she never explicitly describes that. She didn't ever call herself Buddhist. Um, we know from the correspondence that she had with particularly Neil Gunn, they were just very interested in, in meaning and what it means to be, to be human, 
um, and in the kind of spiritual dimension to life. Um, but they tend not to define that in terms of affiliation with particular philosophy, philosophies or, or religious traditions. Um, and so, yeah, I was just really interested because although she makes that reference in that last paragraph, she then goes on to talk about the very strong sense of identity, the I am, which is actually not very Buddhist. Um, and so I kind of reflect on, on that as well, and the fact that there is a lot that comes through in the Living Mountain that is more owed to her Judeo-Christian heritage than I think many people would give credit to. And that, that is there right through to the last paragraph as well. So I found that really interesting in terms of my own you know, my own experiences of growing up, you know, surrounded by a whole lot of different religions, but being rooted within the Christian tradition myself, um, to reflect on what her journey might have been and what she explores through the Living Mountain, as well as through through her other literature. So I reflect also on her novels and her poetry in this book as well. And you, there is a definite journey in her own thinking. Um, so in, in the body of poetry that was published a lot earlier, there's reference to creator and to God, because by the time she gets to the Living Mountain, she talks about creation, but she doesn't talk about creator. So I found that fascinating. Yeah. I know, um, now Trevor talks about looking upside down through the lights, which I think is the best place in the world to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I've already got everywhere. Um, I definitely did, tried it at the same place that she did, which is on the lip of Loch Corrie and Loch um, and, uh, and, 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 and John did the same thing when we were out on winter skills training and we had to go upside down, down, down the slope with, uh, with an ice axe. And um, yeah, I think it was perched in that little hollow on the slope and then lying back down the slope. And then John said, and oh, this is the damn shepherd moment. <laughs> I reached by the public saying, no, 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 she had her feet firmly on the ground. She didn't have an ice axe in her hand. She wasn't about to go sailing down a, a slope. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the amazing thing about trying it is, is that no matter where you are, if you, if you stand and you look down at the, between your legs at the world, it's, it is extraordinary how it changes. And so much of what she explores is the nature of perception, how we see and experience the world, and how our perceptions change our experience of the world and our perspective on it. But yet, there is an essence, there is a truth, there is a reality at the core. You know, the mountain has its own life, regardless of how people experience it, interpret it, describe it, come to it. And for her, she set out to discover the essence of the moment. I think we might need to um, pull, oh, we'll take one more from Kathy and then, um, yeah, then we can. Um, it struck me when you were talking about being in the moment and in the place and, you know, fully embedded in it. When you're writing, are you somewhere else? Or do you write sitting on the side of a mountain? Or how do you balance that being in it, with it, but then stepping away and penning it? Yeah, and that, that's a really interesting challenge. So I didn't tend to, to, to write a lot while I was out and about, partly just because of the conditions. <laughs> um, so I would just take a little notebook for sort of scrappy notes some of the time, I'd take lots of photos as an aid memoir, and then try and type things up as quickly as possible when I got home um, to, to fill it in. Um, but also, you, you know, you're right in that when you know you're going to write about an experience, it does also change the way you experience it. Sometimes, for the worse, because you're thinking about how you're going to describe what you're seeing, but then sometimes for the better because it is making you pay attention and making you be very aware. So, you know, you can be conscious of the, the double-edged experience of, of writing about the place. You know. Well, I think, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll maybe pause on the questions there. And I realized I was going to cut the cake earlier so that our glamorous assistants could um, slice it all up for us to have later, but I forgot to. So I'll, I'll cut the cake now, uh, and then we'll have a, a final piece of music from Hamish. So come with me and take the cake. Right, thank you to Neil.
The bar is open at the boathouse till 10.30 tonight if anyone wants to hang around for a bit longer. So I've got lots of people to thank, so I'll just get through the whole list and then you can have a big round of thunderous applause for them all at once. Um, so thanks go to my whole publishing team at Polygon Books and my agent, Kathy Summerhays, uh, to all the readers who make this worth the work. And then tonight in particular for the team at Lock Inch, um, to Mitch Waits at the Dome, uh, the great service, uh, to Neil Reed, our chair, to Hamish Napier, to Katrina Brown, who's been doing the filming here, to Sarah Wiley, who's been handling the front of house, Luke Atherby, managing book sales, uh, and all of the people in the acknowledgements of the book, many of whom are here tonight and who help, uh, to all of my friends and family, uh, many of whom are here also tonight, for your love and encouragement, uh, to all of you for your support in being here, some of you having come quite a long way. Uh, and then in particular for Alistair, my perfect hill companion. Hey. And uh, actually, I need a, a copy of the book. Here we go. I just wanted to read um, the last few words of thanks to you in the, in the acknowledgements. Finally, love and long gratitude to my parents, lifelong gratitude to my parents, Warren and Jesse, for raising me in mountains and with the faith to move them, to my soul friends for walking life's pilgrimage with me, to Sam and Luke for bringing joy to the trail, and most of all to Alistair for carrying the heaviest load and for being my perfect companion uphill and downhill. Thank you for bringing me to the pilgrims. This is one of his tunes and I'll finish uh, that, follow that with a tune called Anne Karen Gore. So thank you very much. <laughs>